welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I am excited to have you here listening to the podcast, watching this week's video. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer here at the firm, and we like to give you our weekly best thoughts and macro commentary, uh, which is meant to be a bit different than our daily DC Today, which we do every Monday through Thursday for your reading pleasure, the dctoday.com, where we just give a, a simple uh, snapshot of markets uh, and a number of other categories each and every day. But the um, Dividend Cafe today is going to be a bit different. I think I spent a lot of time last week in the immediate aftermath of what had happened out of Washington, D.C., talking about why a lot of the political issues and particularly that unrest had not translated into difficulties in markets. Markets have really come out strong this year, particularly for those things uh, that we're invested in that were out of favor last year. Very, very strong start to 2021 in dividend growth and energy and financials in particular. Well, I don't, uh, so hopefully I answered those questions last week uh, about the disconnection between markets and some of the, the tremendous and unfortunate uh, actions of what are taking place around the country in a very variety of venues. And, and overall, just political and tribal and, and divisive climate in which really our country's been in for some time. So I'm not gonna talk about any of that. And I've, I, I think the last 40 seconds, I talked about it more than I said I was going to. DividendCafe.com, the written commentary this week, doesn't talk about any of it at all. And, and that's because if there's anything that uh, I know will give people a reprieve from the political and the toxic and the tribal, it's macroeconomics. And I know this stuff is, is really a great respite and escape for all of you. So you, if you detect my sarcasm, it's only because I'm assuming some of you don't think that's true, but I actually do. And I make the comment, I'm going to talk about the great debate that exists in, in the economic world we're in right now, which is fundamentally, I'll blow the, the lead here, is going, is really um, a debate between uh, whether or not the, the, the pressures and headwinds we face are of an inflationary nature or our deflationary nature. And I think that is sort of the underlying tension that exists. And I happen to eat, sometimes participate in, but certainly observe um, a constant dialogue that exists amongst ideological foes, academic opponents, if you will, on all sides of this issue. And there can be some really heated debate and disagreement and whatnot. And yet, it, it, the behavior that goes along with it, let's just say, doesn't look quite like um, political fights on Twitter or, or cable news do. And so I, I do think that there's a, a bit of respite from all the stuff that goes into this. But I also think that if I'm an investor, I want to hear, and, and, and somebody like myself is here to speak to you, whether because you're a client who's paying me or you're, or you're a non-client who's interested in what we have to say, I think you should be more interested in what I'm talking about today than this other stuff because the stuff I'm talking about today and I'm going to end up doing it as a two-parter with, with a follow-up next week is significantly important. And the way I kind of go into this topic is say, do you believe that if we were going to be in a zero to one or two percent interest rate environment versus a four, five, six percent interest rate environment, that that would change the way one might want to be invested? Do you believe that the level of inflation, if we had 1% to 3% annual inflation versus 4 5 6% inflation, that that would impact the P-E ratios that are so important, the valuations that are so important in the stock prices? Do you believe that really, really loose credit, uh, meaning an ab abundance of access to credit at a low cost of credit, has one impact on risk assets and that very tight credit and expensive credit has a different impact. So if all of these questions seem obvious in the answer, that's on purpose. They are very, very obvious. A rhetorical is not the right word. And, and, and so therefore, because I think all of those things I just said fundamentally get down to the question of inflation versus deflation, I guess what I'm suggesting is that this topic very clearly, with only one degree of separation, has tremendous import to your uh, portfolio management and your portfolio mentality. But I would also say that, it, uh, let's say you weren't going to change anything in your allocation no matter what. You, you, it was a coin flip. You don't know what the inflation, deflation stuff looks like, and 
So your outlook on those various things can't be uh, used to to alter how you would necessarily uh, impact impact your portfolio allocation. Well, it certainly, I think everyone would agree, is likely to ex impact the expected rate of return. So regardless of what behavioral things may go along with it, um, what we would expect out of stock market uh, re results, if we are going into a period of 5% inflation, is much different than if we stay in a period of 1% inflation, for example. And so I think this has a lot of relevance to um, how we think about our portfolios, decisions we may make, and relevance to the actual expected rates of return. And of course, a lot of times the rates of return, rates of yield, rates of cash flow generation, these things drive our expectations as accumulators of capital. They drive our expectations of withdrawers of capital. And therefore, you really have to think that we um, have a tremendous financial planning and, and wealth management implication around this whole topic. So it's not merely academic, it's not merely cerebral, it's not armchair stuff, it has a lot of practical import, but that doesn't make it easy and, and, it, and it doesn't uh, contradict any of our rules about humility. You, you, so we have to take a very comprehensive approach to how we look at this. I want you to think back to a year ago now, it was somewhat still pre-COVID, even though COVID was in China and, and COVID might very well, and I think was, in the United States, we didn't know about it. So the whole kind of COVID awareness and COVID economic impact was still a couple months off. But the interest rates have begun to go down, and then of course really, really went down when we got into March. The 10-year bond yield were beginning its descent. So far now, we've seen this year, a year later, 10-year bond yield has gone up. Now, when I say up, we're talking about 1.1, 1.15% uh, off of a 0.8%, you know, so uh, it, it, it's marginal, but the direction last year of, of yields was down and this year the yields have gone up. Uh, the dollar throughout the bulk of last year was declining um, and, and at certain periods quite, quite significantly so, at least quite consistently so. And actually, the dollar has sort of checked up a little bit here so far this year for a number of reasons. And um, you look at oil prices, even before the Saudi-Russia debacle of early March, uh, oil prices had begun the year going straight down around both supply and demand realities. And uh, now, right now, we're back to $53 oil here. And, and I think oil's up 12% or so in the first nine days of, of, uh, count of the calendar year. So three of the most significant indicators of certain economic conditions versus a year ago, yields going a different direction, interest rates on the, on the longer end, oil prices, and, and um, uh, the, the direction of the dollar. Well, the thing is, is that they're doing all this for totally different reasons. And, and, and one of the suspicions one may have is, hey, are we maybe getting a little inflationary pressure? Uh, because the, the dollar and the, and the bond yields and, and oil prices could indicate such. It's a very fair, very prima facie acceptable question to, to look into. The thesis that we have is that there are uh, longer term in a more secular environment, far um, superior, and what I mean by that is not that they're better, but they're more prevalent and more powerful disinflationary, deflationary forces that are, are overpowering the efforts. The money supply has risen a great deal in our country, and that is on purpose. And as the Fed has tried to increase money supply as a byproduct, not the direct policy tool, but a byproduct of the policy tool of quantitative easing, um, th which is part of what they're trying to do to mo uh, implement monetary stimulus. The um, Question is whether or not that additional money supply is in and of itself inflationary. And, and it is our belief, along with the great economist Irving Fisher, that money supply times its velocity is the key ingredient in the quantity theory of money, the inflation level, price level in the economy. And that the Fed has a lot of tools, and the Congress, even with fiscal stimulus, you saw Joe Biden this week has proposed another 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus package. The Fed and the government have tools to increase money supply. They don't have tools to very easily increase velocity and they do have tools that when implemented 
can self-reinforce a downward pressure on velocity, which is the negative feedback loop or the deflationary cycle that I believe we've been in and been in for quite some time and is indeed my belief that we will be in and have to fight against that lower and slower growth as a result of this deflationary environment. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is read DividendCafe.com to kind of see some of these charts, get a feel for some of the vocabulary, what a weak dollar means and doesn't mean. We talk about a weak dollar as a counterpart to other currencies, and we talk about a weak dollar meaning it buys you less ice cream than it used to. And both are accurate ways to use the expression, but they're totally different ways, and I don't want us to get those two things confused. The purchasing power of a dollar is a reference to inflation and impact of inflation, and the weakness of the dollar and, and as an uh, um, exchange value is a totally different situation altogether. And people miss so often in some of the hyperbole exist about dollar conversation, currency, U.S. strength, U.S. prominence, the future, stability, that um, whenever they look to a lot of the weak issues or really vulnerable parts of what we're doing economically in our country, they have to compare it to other countries. And that's what is often neglected. And, and to say the dollar is getting weaker without looking at what other currencies are doing, and by other currencies, I mean what the actions of other governments are doing that impacts their own currency, it misses a significant part of this story. So what we're gonna do in part two is pull this together to make the case that we have longer term deflationary uh, secular pressures that need to be the driver of our portfolios, all the while freely acknowledging transitory and cyclical um, temporary blips of inflation that can come here and there. And so we refer to these terms right now as how they impact investors and when in real life, when, how they affect shoppers can be a very different story because a consumer who goes out and, and the ice cream might cost a bit more, but more importantly, when there's targeted inflation or, or, or a very specific inflation that is a byproduct, usually not a desirable one, of policy, and you see it in housing, and you see it in, in student uh, loans, which is really from the cost of higher education, and of course, healthcare cost. So how we pull together this narrative of investors fighting deflation and consumers fighting inflation is something I look forward to unpacking in part two. Read DividendCafe.com, reach out with questions, and if you are bored by this, uh, draft an email, but don't hit send. How's that? Subscribe to Divin Cafe podcast. Subscribe to Divin Cafe video for with YouTube. Uh, easier way for you to get it. Easier for us as well. And in the meantime, have a great weekend. We have a Monday market holiday. Look forward to coming back to you with the DC today on Tuesday. God bless. <music>